So last week, Pastor Jeff kind of <coughs> laid the groundwork for this new series, I Love My Church. And uh, this week, we're going to talk a little bit about community. But before we do that, let, let's pray. God, we just thank you so much for allowing us to come together as, as friends and family. God, to worship and to be about you, be focused on you, and to strive to be like you. God, we just ask that during this time here, God, that you would open our minds, soften our hearts, and allow us just to be receptive to your word. And God, I ask that you speak to me and through me, allow nothing of myself to remain, but God, I want your word that's true and that lasts forever. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Um, so, so far, throughout my life, I've lived in a bunch of different neighborhoods. I've done a lot of traveling and such. And one thing I've noticed about driving through different communities and stuff, every time I drive through one, I see fences. There's fences all around, and they're used for a lot of different things, and they come in a lot of varying, varying sizes and shapes and styles. Some are short, some are small and transparent, some are plastic, some are metal, some are wood, some are these big huge walls like fortresses. Some of them are considered privacy fences. But in just about every case, what a fence is designed to do is either keep something in or to keep something out. I remember growing up in, in my neighborhood where I, where I lived as a kid. The neighborhood was a fairly older neighborhood. There were a couple kids our age, I when I say our, I mean me, me and my brothers, there was three houses down, the Stinsons. They lived with a daughter and a son. The daughter was around the same age as my older brother, and the son was a little bit younger, a year or two, um, than my younger brother. So they were like the only kids in the neighborhood that we could play with, and, and we kind of hung out there every now and again. And I remember when we played, anything we played with out on the front porch, had to be picked up, had to be put away. No one could see a mess in the front. But if we played in the back, it was okay to leave anything scattered around. But there were not, not allowed any toys on the porch. The front of the house, the bushes and the grass were kept trimmed. The backyard, though, was a little bit different. The grass may not have been cut as often. The bushes, maybe not trimmed as frequently. Clotheslines maybe sagged because of hanging wet clothes over and over again on them. It was a little bit messier in the back. A little less organized. And their fence between the front yard and the back yard separated that. It was a barrier between the front which everyone was allowed to see, and the back, which is where they mainly live. We're going to kind of continue in this series of I Love My Church, and this concept is going to go, be going into playing a big part in what we'll see and what we'll talk about today. See, God's plan for the church is that we would live connected lives. God wants us to live connected with Him and with each other. God wants us to know true community. So what do these fences have to do with that? Let's try and find out. Hebrews 10 verses 19 through 25 says this, And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean. And our bodies have been washed with pure water. 
Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Before we unpack this, let's kind of go back to the fence. Let's kind of picture our lives as a yard. If a lot of us are honest, we'd admit that we'd like a good fence. We're not, we're, we're comfortable with showing what we are comfortable showing people and letting people know about us is our front yard. And we try to keep that a pristine, picture perfect yard. <clears throat> Nicely manicured grass, beautiful flower beds, nicely weeded, a nice welcome mat at the front door. That's just for decoration. The front yard is what we show people. But the backyard, that's a bit different. That's the real us. And getting in there is generally by invitation only. In fact, I'm going to build a fence because I'm not sure I want you to know what's going on with the real me. I don't want you to see the parts of my life that aren't so pristine. The backyard is private. The backyard is me. Everything in the front of the house, though, <coughs> perfectly presented. Nice, neat, at the back of the house, behind the fence, is where the true us resides. This is the yard of our lives. See, here's the deal about fences. God's not really a big fan of them. Before we go any further, don't get me wrong. God doesn't have a problem with the fence around your actual yard or your actual home. I don't want you to leave here and start taking sledgehammers and things and say, they say in church fences are bad. It's not what I'm saying. Uh, please don't hear that. But as far as being in relationship with God and being in a community with each other, God wants us to rethink our fences. So if we intend to love our church the way God wants us to, then we have to know that Jesus crashes the fence. And before we talk about the fence that we put between us and people, we have to realize the barrier that exists between God and us. The first part of our Hebrews passage tells us, and so dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him for our goodly conscience that has been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean. And our bodies have been washed with pure water. Here the author of Hebrews is talking about the fact that because of Jesus, we now have a way to come back to God. You see, in the, in the Old Testament times, there was this guy who was elected, who was the high priest. And he was the only one that was able to come into the presence of God for the people of Israel. And what would happen once a year, everybody would come to Jerusalem and they would make, they would make sacrifice. And the high priest would be the one that goes behind this huge, thick curtain in the temple to bring the people to God and to seek forgiveness for them. And he was the only one. No one else was even allowed to go in with him. And so what they would do is they would actually tie a rope around him because they believe that when you're in the presence of God, there is a good chance you might just drop that. Because of his perfection and his holiness. So they would tie a rope around him. 
and if something happened where you couldn't come out, they would just pull them out. And they'll let you be my priest. But because of what Jesus did on the cross, he becomes our high priest. He becomes our person that goes to God for us, in defense of us. And even though God destroyed the fence between him and us because of what Jesus did on the cross, we still attempt to build fences between ourselves and others. Because Jesus is our great high priest and he crashes the fence, that veil, that big curtain, when Jesus died on the cross, was torn in two from top to bottom, as if God was saying, you don't need it anymore. Because of that, we are able to confidently draw near to God. And you see, crashing the fence is, an e is as easy as admitting that we need Him. We can't live life on our own. <clears throat> Excuse me. We'll never make it into God's presence with a fence separating us. Fences are kind of put there for a reason. And if we continue to have that fence between us and God, it makes it a lot harder for us to get into the presence of God. The book of Romans, though, gives us a little bit more detail behind what our passage in Hebrews is talking about. Romans 3.23, we all know that everyone has sinned, falls short for the glory of God. Basically saying, we all have this giant fence. Romans 6.23 talks about how the wage of our sin that builds that wall is death. And that shows that, that because of that fence, we will never get to God. Romans 5.8 talks about how God knew we would have this big fence even before we had a yard. Even before there was a yard, God knew there was going to be a fence. Romans 10, verses 9 through 10 talks about if we will confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, we will be saved. And that talks about if we admit we have a fence and that we need it torn down, Jesus then crashes that fence. And my favorite. Romans 10, 13. And that shows us that Jesus never denies a fence-crashing job. Ever. If we ask Jesus to crash that fence, he is more than happy to do so. See, we're born building fences. We're born building walls and structures designed to hide, designed to protect, or to confine who we really are. And to keep us separated from God. We're born into sin. That's our first fence that we have to deal with. And that keeps us from true community with God. And it's only when we admit our failing, realizing and accepting that Jesus on the cross crash the fence of sin. And only because of that we have a relationship with God and we can truly be in community with God. So let me ask you, have you ever drawn near to God? Have you ever acknowledged that Jesus, what Jesus has done on the cross and allowed Him into your life? Have you ever acknowledged that? I'm talking about, have you let him into your life all, entirely, the front and the backyard? Realize that the barrier between you and Jesus has been crashed by what Jesus did on the cross. Surrender your life to him. Draw near to him in relationship and close to him 
and community. Also, if we intend to love our church like God's, God intends us to, we need to allow others into our yard. We come to this building on, on Sundays and we sing songs, we play games with children. Sometimes we eat, sometimes we smile and say good morning. But a lot of us do it from behind the fence. You might be thinking, but I thought you said Jesus broke down the fence. And he did. For every single one of us, Jesus has broken down the fence and made a way possible for us to get to God. We've got to wonder how does that impact us as people? How does that impact us as a community? Imagine all of mankind standing before a fence of sin, and it just comes tumbling down when Jesus dies on the cross. So when I draw near to God to become his follower, when you draw near to God to become his follower, there's not a fence anymore. Which means there's no fence existing in the community of God. At least there shouldn't. But what we do is we start taking this wood from the crashed fence and we start building a new one. We start building a new one to put between us and others. See, even though Jesus has crashed our fence, we still want people to see only the pretty parts of our life. And the pretty parts of our yard. We don't want them to see our laundry, clean or dirty, hanging on the clothesline in the back, so we keep building those walls. We keep very careful tabs on what part of our estate people are allowed to walk around and see. We're pretty good at building fences. But don't forget what Pastor Jeff said last week. He said if we are going to truly experience loving our church, then that means intentionally loving our church. And loving each other is impossible to do from behind a fence. So what do we do? What do we do with all the fences that we've built? It's hard to truly know how to love each other. Because we're all so different. But thank goodness the writer of Hebrews kind of gives us a perfect prescription on how to love others. Verse 25, he says, Let us not neglect our meeting together. What's really interesting about this passage, most of you may have heard it preached or recited from pastors that over the years kind of maybe using it as a, as a guilt tool to kind of let people know that the Bible talks about us <coughs> meeting together on a regular basis and try to guilt those that aren't too active in their regular attendance to start thinking, hey, maybe I need to be attending more. But in reality, the author was talking about something bigger. Yes, he could be referring to Sundays, but also something more than Sundays. He's talking about an everyday assembly. He's talking about doing life together. He's talking about living in community. You see, community means we don't build fences. Community means we head below the surface. We get to know people at a deeper level. Community means authenticity. We're no longer faking it. We're sharing ourselves with others. There's a deeper relationship that we can have sitting in our pews, that we can have them sitting in our pews on Sunday morning. Community means 
standing in someone's yard and allowing them to stand in mine, to stand in yours. Both of our dirty, stinky, unkept yards, with all the toys thrown everywhere, the weeds not pulled, and the shed that desperately needs painting, allowing us to each other be involved in that and to see that. I don't know if you remember, but years ago there was a television show called Home Improvement. And Tim Allen was was the main character, and he and his family lived next to a guy named Wilson. And in between Tim Allen's family's house and Wilson's house was this fence. And you never saw much of Wilson. Throughout the entire series, all we ever saw was about from his nose up. The Taylors lived next door to Wilson for years. Yet they never saw his face. Sometimes it's like that for church. We sit in pews with people. We serve on committees with, together. We may even enjoy a Bible study with one another. <clears throat> but we never see someone's whole face. We only get a glimpse of them from behind our fence. Jane Doe is standing over there on the other side of the fence, and maybe we see her face. Maybe we don't. It doesn't matter, because at the end of the day, there's still a fence separating us. I can't embrace them during a family tragedy when there's a fence. They can't really see what's happening over in, in my life. They can't see if me and my wife are having a disagreement. They can't see if my kids are misbehaving. See, the fence really impedes community. We have to get into someone's yard to fully know them, to fully be involved in their life. Hebrews 10, 25 says, And let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. So whose yard are you in? Who are you allowing into your yard? Maybe this takes place for you through Sunday school, through small group Bible study, Maybe you've just allowed a few people in to see past your fence, and it's not through any formal ministry of our church. But if we are truly going to experience not only the church, but also life as God intended it, then we can't live behind the fence. To truly love one another, you have to love someone in your church. Now, this doesn't mean that everyone's going to transform into this to a social extrovert. What it means is that we don't live in isolation. Community is standing in someone's yard. And it means you stand in someone else's yard. And you enjoy their company. Imagine being a kid, going to a birthday party where the host didn't plan anything. There might be a plain bag of potato chips open on the table, some very weak Kool-Aid, but that's it. No games, no dessert, no face painting, no pin the tail on a donkey, nothing. That would probably be a pretty boring party. <coughs> pretty dull. Wouldn't you agree? Wouldn't be one you'd want to stay at. And you'd leave thinking, they didn't even try to have a good time. They didn't even try to incorporate anybody else. Hebrews 10.24 says, let us think of ways to motivate one another 
to acts of love and good works. Let us think of ways. Let us contemplate. Let us strategize. Think of it as planning a successful birthday party. Living life in one another's yard without fences is going to take not only intentionality, but also strategy. Community is finding ways to encourage one another to love and to do good deeds. Beyond church programming, and beyond church sermons, see, seeing beyond the walls and fences that we built and offering to help paint the shed, offering to help pull the weeds, offering to help watch the kids. It's bringing a meal in times of crisis. It's having those go-to numbers in your cell phone for when your car breaks down. It's knowing who to call when you want to go on a couple dates. It's inviting someone over for dinner. It's teaming up when we have a church service product project and working alongside friends. It's enjoying one another and helping each other to enjoy serving Jesus. And the thing is, these things don't happen automatically. They happen when we consider how to make them happen. So let me kind of suggest some <coughs> strategy points for all of us as a church family. <clears throat> One strategy point is we have to have healthy expectations. An unhealthy expectation is that we'll all know everyone. That every single person will be best friends with everyone in here. That's not quite realistic. A healthy expectation is that I can build some great connections throughout the family, throughout the community, great friendships with some, and deep relationships with few. And this will take time. But we have to have a healthy goal in mind. Another strategy point is we need to realize that baby steps are okay. So let, let's be clear. Living without fences doesn't mean that you're going to just let every single person into the more personal parts of your life. The first day you meet. That's not the goal in any sense. At first we'll be hanging out in the front yard with people. Then we may invite them into the living room. Then maybe out in the backyard for a meal or a cookout. It's going to take time. But that's okay. You won't let everyone in. But you need to work toward letting someone in at some point. The last strategy point that, I, that I'll, I'll suggest is we need to take ownership. We need to realize that this is everyone's job, not just someone else's job. We all need to work at it. We all need to work at loving each other and being in community <coughs> with each other outside of Sunday morning. If you're sitting down waiting for everyone to come to you, you may be sitting in the wrong place. On a scale of 1 to 10, with 1 being the lowest and 10 being the highest, how much effort are you putting in to connect with others? What would you need to do to raise your number by one or two levels in the next few weeks? I think if, if we take these little, tiny, easy strategy points, the whole life of our church could change. And we as a church are, are investing in the first steps of 
being connected with each other, by having a little luncheon today after Sunday school. And we hope you'll all come to it and be a part of it. We hope that this luncheon will help us all start to tear down our fences so that we can enjoy the company of our community. As we leave this morning, love your church. Know Jesus has crashed that fence between you and God. Allow someone into your yard. Not just the front, but back as well. Enjoy the company of each other. Start considering how you can be connected with others for encouragement and for growth. <coughs> Community is key to a thriving church. <coughs> Community is key to love. And I think if we dive into that idea and that concept of being in community with each other, there's no telling what God will do in this church, in this community, and in this county. But it takes all of us to be a part of it. Let's pray. God, just thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the instruction. And God, thank you for the understanding and the willingness to crash our fence, to help us to understand the need for community, the strength we get from it, the resources that come with it, and God, the love we feel through it. God, I pray that each one of us in this room would be so willing to start taking down our individual fences, to allow people into our lives so that our lives can be more fulfilled, so that our lives can be more of a reflection of who you are. God, I just pray that this church would be a community of faith that reflects the community you have between Father, Son, and Spirit. And God, I pray that through our community, the community of Flora, God will be impacted. And God, I, see, I pray that through, through that, as we motivate each other to acts of love, and we encourage each other in life, God, that it wouldn't be just in here on Sunday mornings, but it would be Monday to Monday, Sunday to Sunday, everywhere we are, community would be our mindset. Thank you so much for your willingness to crash that fence on, on the cross and give us a way back to you. God, we just thank you and we love you so much. It's in Jesus' name.